Hello, my name is Audrey Scanlon. I'm the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Pennsylvania, coming to you today on June 3rd, Friday, in the year 2022. This is the final episode in the series that we've been running since Easter called Ask Me Anything or Ask the Bishop. And I want to thank you for the many, many questions that I've received. I have not been able to answer every one but I have had a chance to have some phone conversations and some email exchanges, as well as to participate in this video series answering some questions that have come to me. The one that I would like to conclude our series with today is really a timely issue as it is an issue coming before our general convention again, uh, as we meet this summer in Baltimore. And the issue is that of what we call open communion or communion opening the um, opportunity for people, all people to receive communion. Now in our constitution and canons of the Episcopal Church, this book gets updated every three years when we have convention and we pass resolutions as a collected body of Christ. The um, Canons as they currently stand, Canon 1, 17.7, on um, regulations respecting the laity. It says, no unbaptized person shall be eligible to receive Holy Communion in this church. No unbaptized person shall be eligible to receive Holy Communion in this church. We have done through the years studies on this. We have appointed the Standing Committee on Liturgy, Standing Commission on Liturgy and Music to study this. We've had um, great debates on social media in the House of Bishops, on and on, and we, we um, just can't come to a place where we are willing or ready to change the official rule, although the practice, I would say, of open communion varies widely across our church. And so this time for this convention, the Diocese of Northern California has brought forth a resolution inviting us to consider this again. And as I said, this group of 22 theologians just yesterday released an extensive letter which explained their, their understanding of the theology of Holy Eucharist and why they still support the understanding that baptism is what we do before we partake in Holy Communion um, in our church. So that you may be wondering what I think about this. Um, and I'm curious what you think about it. Some of the common arguments for why we should um, include people who have not been baptized in communion is that it's an act of hospitality. And it is a way to include people, particularly seekers, in our tradition, in our church, that we don't set up barriers for, for what it is to be participants in, in the life of our community. The letter that I referenced talks about Holy Communion as not just a holy meal, but as a remembrance of the sacrifice that Christ made of himself on the altar. And so this is a sacrifice that we, that we participate in that takes place on an altar, much like Jesus at the Last Supper referenced the sacrificial life of the Jewish community that he was a part of and how priests in the Jewish tradition make sacrifice at altars. And so that is one of the ways that we understand what is happening for us in our Episcopal uh, language. We talk about the real presence of Christ, um, that we don't believe in necessarily transubstantiation, which is more of a Roman Catholic view of, of what's happening in the Eucharist. Uh, we, we tend to believe that it's more than just what we would call a memorial. We believe something in the middle, of course, being Episcopalian, something that we call the real presence of Christ. And so in the Eucharist, when we receive the bread and the wine of communion, when we receive the body and blood of Christ, we believe that Christ is present with us, that the veil of heaven is, is slightly um, opened and we are in communion with all the saints. 
past, present, and yet to come. And so that's a fairly heavy thing to imagine. Uh, when I first started considering what I thought about all of this, I thought, well, I need to check my bias, um, as many of us have, that bias against change. Am I, am I not wanting to change the canon simply because as a human being, I am slightly resistant. My default mode is to be resistant to change. And I, I really don't think that's the case. I think that as a bishop who's taken a vow to uphold the doctrine, discipline, and worship of the church as we have received them, that, that I consider the, the sacrament of Holy Eucharist to be precious and to be dear and to be reverenced. And so there, I believe there should be some sort of um, gateway or protection around the sacrament. It's one of the reasons that we believe that ordained people are authorized, uh, lifted up by community to be people to celebrate the holy mysteries, that, that we just don't have anybody celebrate the holy mysteries. I also know what it is like as a priest to have to say no to somebody. I have had many um, occasions through the years of my ministry where I've been going down the altar rail distributing bread and come to a child with their hands open and either that child is not baptized or that child is baptized but for one reason or another their parent has, has decided to withhold the sacrament from the child at that age. And there's, it's painful to walk by a child uh, or anybody who has their hand out. And so the way that I was trained in this practice is to use what I would call pastoral discretion. The rector who trained me said, if somebody puts their hand out, I'm going to put something in it. Um, we don't check baptismal certificates at the altar rail. And yet, again and again, if it happens, not just once, not just twice, three, four, five times, regularly, consistently, then I wanna have a conversation about why not baptism? Because baptism is the gateway, baptism is the um, initiation rite into the community in Christ. And so if somebody wants to participate so fully in our life that they are communing with Christ at the altar rail through the presence of the sacrament, then why aren't we baptizing them? So those are some of the things that I've been thinking about. I, I also think that if we want to talk about being more inclusive, um, better hosts, um, more hospitable to people, who are seeking a deeper connection, if we want to be more inclusive, then we need to do a better job in the beginning, not waiting for people to come up to the altar rail, but in the very beginning. So how do we welcome people? How do we invite people to church? That's the role of the evangelist. How do we do that in a way that makes church compelling and exciting? How do we share our story of the faith that we have so that others want to come and see. Um, how do we welcome them when they get there? How do we take somebody uh, who's tentatively standing on the threshold of our church and welcome them in? And then how do we connect them? How do we incorporate them into the life of the community? These are the places I think that the Episcopal Church has to work before we start talking about um, changing, changing rules in the Book of Common Prayer or in our, in our canons and constitution. Those are some of my thoughts. I am curious what your thoughts are. I have been following the, the um, debate, if you will, on social media. It is very, very lively. There are people who are passionate about the inclusion of anybody who wants to to find a deeper relationship with, with God, to come and feel free to come up to the altar. And there are others like me who are perhaps more conservative and who believe that this sacrament is so precious and so holy that it is worth um, 
worth holding on to for those of us who are committed Christians who we might not have it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out, but we have entered into that community of the body of Christ before we partake. There's a lot to think about here and I would invite your feedback. As a closing prayer, let me pray the one of our post-communion prayers. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you've graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you've fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Until next week, I pray that you are well. Next week we have the presiding bishop coming, so I'll be talking a little bit about that when we get together. And until then, may God bless you and guide you and keep you always.